Okay, well, welcome. It's Tuesday, the 8th of July, and we're going to continue with our discussion over uh, Chapter 20, uh, which is the arteries and veins and vessel and blood pressure chapter. Uh, who wants to give me a few recapping moments from what we discussed last time? What were the major themes of our last discussion, Vince? What did we talk about? Or Jordan, or Jared, right? The three musketeers back there, any of you, right? So we even go back. Let's go back. What did we talk about? The very beginning, we started talking about what? How vessels, what our vessels are, right? Arteries versus veins versus capillaries. We talked about the different uh, characteristics of each. Uh, mentioned the different uh, histology that we find, the different characteristics of each of those three kinds of vessels, yes? Mm -hmm. And then we... Um, Toward the end of that, what I remember is we discussed three different ways that the body assures that it's getting the proper oxygenation. And there was local control, neural control, and hormonal control. So let's just kind of review that little bit. That's just before this. So let me go back to that. And uh, the very top of this conversation, just really quick, not all the story, but just part of it. And that is if tissue is not, if tissues are not getting enough oxygen in a localized place, right? Not your whole body, but just in a localized way, what does the body do? If you're not getting enough oxygen to a particular place, it's going to increase the oxygenation. Another way of saying that it's going to increase the perfusion, right? It's going to bring more oxygen per gram of tissue into that location. And how does it do so? The vessels will vasodilate. What will cause them, what will cause this vasodilation to occur? What are the endothelial cells, the lining of the blood vessel cells, what are they sensing? They're sensing a change in pH, right? Absolutely, a change in pH. And if the pH is changing, um, what would cause vasodilation? The pH would be doing what? Going down, right? Because if the pH is going down, what does it tell us about the local environment? It's becoming more acidic. It's becoming more acidic because there's a buildup of CO2, right? And that CO2 would be inversely related to the amount of oxygen. So there isn't enough oxygen. There's too much CO2. The pH is dropping down. The endothelial cells sense that, and they say, whoa, we need more blood supply here. So they vasodilate. That's going to bring, in the smooth muscles will assist with that. That's going to bring more uh, blood flow to that localized area. So that happens, as we call local, that does not involve any hormones, that doesn't involve any nervous system signals, that is truly at the microscopic local environment of this ischemic event, right? Do we agree the word ischemia? Ischemia would be a lack of oxygen. What's another word for a lack of oxygen? hypoxemia, right, hypo, lower ox, oxygen, emia of the blood. If something is hypoxemia, what's an, uh, hypoxemic, what's another term that essentially almost always goes with that? If there's not enough oxygen, there would also be too much CO2. The term for that would be hypercapnia, right? So hypercapnia, hypercapnic suggests that there's too much CO2. And another word that kind of goes right along with that, referring to the pH, would be that the blood has become more acidotic, right? More acid. So acidosis, hypercapnia, and hypoxemia, all are terms that sort of tell us the same thing is going on in the localized environment. Now, under neural control, we discussed this a couple times, there are the receptors, uh, the uh, receptors of the baroreceptors and the chemoreceptors. And where are those baroreceptors found in your body? Aortic arch and in the carotid sinuses or in the carotid bodies. Also for the chemoreceptors, also located in the same place. And they're measuring different things. Um, when it comes to the baroreceptors, they're looking at pressure changes. When they're looking at chemoreceptors, they're looking at pH changes. Both of them, though, are going to be, those receptors will be sending nervous signals, signals right, nervous system signals, back to the brainstem. 
specifically back to the medulla oblongata, telling your heart to be increased or decreased in its rate of beating. Right, so that'd be a neural system connection. And there was also the medullary ischemic reflex, which is what kind of response? Do you remember? Change in the cerebral It's a plant. change, yeah, change in the pH. It's a chemoreceptor change detected in the cerebral spinal fluid of the medulla oblongata. So it's that CSF that's going up from the central canal and up around the medulla and the pons. So we're talking about the fourth ventricle is up in that area of the brain. And that's where this CSF fluid is. And there are their own chemoreceptors up there. And they're going to do the same thing, right? If the pH changes suggest that there isn't enough oxygen going to the brain, then it's going to cre create a, uh, an increased blood supply to the brain. And then finally, there are hormones. And make sure you look at each of these hormones. Uh, we've discussed them in passing in different places, and we're going to continue to talk about them today and again when we get to the respiratory and the urinary systems. And that is angiotensin, a very potent vasoconstrictor, which would raise blood pressure. It does so also by promoting sodium retention by the kidneys. ANP, atrial, uh, atrial natriuretic peptide, which is going to send a signal from the atria to the kidneys. Um, ADH, which we talked about since day one, and epinephrine also can have an effect, uh, a hormonal effect, on the vessels. Collectively, what all of these systems are going to do, local, hormonal, and nervous, is to increase or decrease the overall blood flow and therefore the blood pressure going through our vessels. So we see that there's not just one alarm system, right? There are actually three different ways by which, and many hormones, all of which are helping to regulate your overall blood pressure and your blood flow to your tissues, meaning maintaining your perfusion, right? That's what's so important. We've got to maintain perfusion, especially perfusion going to the brain, right? The brain requires a huge amount of oxygen and we can't let it get away with it. Now, um, what if you are bleeding though? What if you are dehydrated? These are things that happen to us, right? We have these local changes in our body, but the brain can't suffer. So if you're, if you're hemorrhaging, if you're bleeding from one area, the brain still has to maintain its oxygenation, and so the body will make that a top priority. And so we see that the body is able to, to use these three different um, chemo and baroreceptors and hormonal signals to maintain its bl blood pressure. And one of the ways it's going to do that is by rerouting the blood. So it's going to necessarily reroute the blood from one organ or from one area to another one, to, to do this. Um, so, for example, what if, um, and again, saying either centrally or locally. So, the, the idea, centrally or locally, we talked about central would be suggesting it's a, an, overall, an overall effect, right? The central nervous system is somehow involved with this, or even the autonomic nervous system is involved, or it's being locally controlled. So, when you're exercising, we know this, uh, when you're exercising, blood is being shunted more to your skeletal muscles and is being shunted away from your digestive system. Um, and there are other times where there is a metabolite accumulation, so you may have a, an increase in some waste product in the local area, and it may or may not affect circulation elsewhere in the body. So we have all this stuff going on. So let's talk about these two types of vasoconstriction. Again, uh, localized. Okay, look at this. Just in a very local area, not the entire body, not centrally, but if there is a particular artery that, um, if, a, if a specific artery constricts, then the pressure downstream of that would drop. Do you agree? Okay, and the pressure upstream of it would rise. So imagine you're squeezing a garden hose. That's a constriction in a localized area, and that means that everything downstream of that will get less pressure, right? Downstream, would, the pressure would drop. There'd be less fluid going down, and there'd be a greater upstream um, uh, pressure. And again, this is, is how the body is going to regulate blood flow. It's going to keep blood flow moving as necessary. And um, again, taking a look like this, if we think about exercise, during exercise, the 
arteries going to your lungs, to your heart, to your muscles are going to vasodilate. You're going to instead vasoconstrict the vessels going to your urinary and digestive systems. Whereas if you're sleeping right after a big meal, then think about what's going to happen during that time. Where is most of your blood flow going? To your intestines and to the intestinal arteries. This is going to increase digestion. Where is blood being released from? Blood is leaving your muscles, right? It's leaving your muscles. If it's leaving your muscles, it's going back toward your core. Do you agree? If, you, if you're restricting the blood going to your extremities, to your legs, that means there's more blood pooling where? In your central body, yes? So what's going to happen to your blood pressure? It's going to go up. It's going to go up, isn't it? So, so during this time, you have vasoconstriction in your lower limbs. That's going to raise the blood pressure above, right, in the majority of the body as that blood comes into the intestines. So just look at this example. It's, it's a nice little picture of this. So while you're running around and while you're exercising, you're going to have a lot of blood flow going down to your legs. You recognize this is the aorta splitting at the common iliac artery, right? And what's not marked here, there's your little internal iliac. Make sense? And so that makes this the what? External iliac, which would eventually go down to your legs to become your femoral, and on it goes. So when you're exercising, you've got a lot of blood flow leaving your legs, going away from your gut, right? Going away from your trunk. That's going to distribute that blood into a larger area and reduce your overall blood pressure. Whereas if you're sleeping uh, or taking a rest after a big meal, you're going to have less blood flow going down to your legs so that you can increase right, the blood flow going to your intestines, for example. It doesn't show it here, but these vessels coming off the aorta it's showing are becoming dilated. So you're increasing your blood flow to the intestinal organs. And in the, in the exercise side, you, it says if you're very small that the vessels going off to perhaps your kidneys, your renal arteries, and off to your gut are constricted. Now, again, where is the majority of this control coming from? Are you controlling this overall blood flow at the level of the aorta? No. Where you're really controlling this mostly is down at the level of the arterioles. Remember, arterioles, for their small size, still have a lot of muscle around them. So that's really where all the regulation is happening. And what was the relationship there? Remind me, what was the mathematical relationship of flow? There were three things, going back as a review as well, a little part that we discussed. What were the three things that influenced flow of blood? What was the equation? Flow was proportional to the change in pressure over resistance, right? So a pressure change, delta P, triangular P, that's the change in pressure over resistance. And then remind me while we're talking about this, what were the three things that can influence resistance? One was length which we said really isn't much of a factor, right? And then the second one was, wasn't it viscosity or thickness of the blood? Right, was that one of them? And we said that really isn't a major issue in a localized way. The big thing was what? The radius of the vessel. And the relationship between flow and the radius was what? R to the fourth power, okay. So there's not much math in this exam, but R to the fourth power, um, there'll be a couple of examples where you'll have to figure that out, and we get, I gave you a couple of examples in the previous PowerPoints. So let's just take a look at where your blood flow is at different times during, under, under different situations. So here you're at rest. It says cardiac output is five liters per minute. Is that about the average? I think I said five and a quarter, something around five liters per minute. Uh, is your normal cardiac output. Uh, remind me, what is cardiac output? Stroke yep, stroke volume times heart rate, right? We got that one down. And so at rest, where is your blood? Well, quite a bit of it's in your muscles. 
but even more of it's in your digestive system, and your kidneys have a lot of filtering going on during this time. Your brain's also getting a pretty good chunk, okay? Everything else is spread out. Now, when you're at moderate exercise, your cardiac output's going up significantly. Here it's showing about 17 or so liters per minute, just as an ob, it can go up much higher with, with extreme exercise. And what you see is that the vast majority of the blood is now being shunted to the muscles. We know this. Don't worry about the numbers, but you know this as a general pattern. Now, the brain, okay, look what the brain is getting. Look at the mils per minute. 700, 750. Essentially the same. Remember I told you the brain, we don't have a choice here. The brain has got to be perfused. It's a smaller slice of the pie, isn't it? Right? It's a smaller fraction of the overall cardiac output, but we see that even during extreme exercise, even when the muscles are getting an extreme amount of the overall blood flow, the brain is still getting about that 700 or 750 mils per minute. So the perfusion to the brain is not changing here. Okay, make sense? It looks like it's really reducing, doesn't it? But you have to look at the fine print to realize that the brain's really not getting less. And neither... Uh, and, and look at this, at rest, the heart's getting about 200. It's getting more, right? When you're exercising, your heart's certainly going get, to get more, your coronary arteries. Where you see a big decrease, boy, digestive and renal are really getting hit hard. They're going way, way down, while the muscles, the skeletal muscles go way, way up. Again, we know this. There's nothing really new there. It's just we've never looked at numbers quite this way before. Okay, so that, that gets us through all the good stuff about arteries and veins and overall flow and the control of that flow. Now what we're going to be looking at is what happens at the capillaries. And again, the capillaries are called the functional unit or the business end of the cardiovascular system because even though the heart's doing all the work, if you will, uh, it's at the capillaries where all of the important exchanges are happening, both of nutrients and water, uh, gases, hormones, you name it, these molecules are moving in and out of your bloodstream at the capillaries. So we're going to talk about capillary exchange. This is a two-way movement of substances, right, both ways, two-way movement of substances across the capillary wall. Remind me what kind of epithelium is found in that capillary wall. Yeah, we got simple squamous epithelium, right? No doubt about that. And this is, again, this list, all the things that your body needs, water, oxygen, glucose, uh, waste products being picked up, fats, minerals, you name it, are moving in and out of your tissues and your bloodstream here at the capillaries. Now, there's three ways by which these chemicals, these substances, are going to pass through the capillary wall. Makes sense, I think. Number one, you're going to see that some capillaries, I'm going to start at the bottom, have fenestrations. Remember, fenestrations are little openings, little windows in the capillaries. There are going to be little spaces between the endothelial cells. Right? So the cells are touching each other, but there's a little bit of leakiness going on between the capillaries. And then the top one says through the actual endothelial cell cytoplasm. So the first one, the molecules are actually being, are, are entering into the cell and moving through the cell. The second one, they're going between the cells. And the third one, they're moving in holes between the cell, bigger, bigger openings between the cells. What processes are involved? Well, from day one, we've talked about diffusion. Remember, diffusion is what? The movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration with no energy, right? Always no energy, just movement across a concentration gradient. Transcytosis. That's really what, number one up here, transcytosis, going across or through the cell. Number three, filtration, suggests that things are moving through a, a hole, right, like filter paper. So that would be more like numbers two or three. And then reabsorption. What does that suggest? Taking back up, not always, but oftentimes using energy. So this is oftentimes, reabsorption is oftentimes an active or an ATP-dependent process. 
Okay, so at first this was, this was no ATP, right? No energy, no ATP for diffusion. Transcytosian going through the cells, filtration going between the cells, and then reabsorption being taken up by the cells, typically through a pro an energy-requiring process. Okay, so diffusion, okay, very important. Things that move in and out of your blood cells via diffusion are some pretty important things like glucose, right? glucose and oxygen. They're moving in and out of your bloodstream, in and out of your tissues based upon diffusion, as is carbon dioxide and some of your other waste products. So these molecules are moving without energy. They're moving through a concentration gradient, and that's what's getting down here at the bottom. Uh, diffusion occurs only if, though, there is the ability of the molecule to fit through either filtration pores or to go intercellular clefts. What does uh, that mean, inter? Within, right? Within the cell, there's these little indentations, if you will. So molecules can move in and out of the cells, again, without energy by diffusion. What's going to do this? What kind of molecules can move by diffusion? Well, we know this. We know that steroids are what kind of molecule? They're lipids, right? They're fats. And lipids can move right through the membrane. So we know that lipid molecules, lipid-soluble molecules, can make their way right through the bilayer of a cell membrane. It turns out that O2 and CO2 also can move through the membrane, not because of their charge, but more because they're so small. So they're also able to basically squiggle through the membranes. Again, they're moving via concentration gradients diffusion. Other molecules are water-soluble, like glucose. So glucose is also taken up. Um, now, you, you may not remember this, but glucose is taken up specifically by facilitated diffusion. Remember what that means? Facilitated diffusion means that there's a carrier that picks up the glucose and brings it into the cell, but that carrier does not require ATP. All right, so it's, not, it's still not an energy-requiring process, but it does require a helper of facilitating protein. If the molecule is too big, it can't diffuse. So these are all very small molecules. Uh, either they're lipid hormones or they're very small like oxygen and CO2. Glucose is pretty small. Electrolytes also, right, things like sodium, potassium, um, but they, they must move through some sort of filtration pore. Then there's transcytosis, and, and this is going to be a, a more regulated process by which molecules, and what, or what, what kind of cells are picking these molecules up? So these are the endothelial cells, aren't they? They're the cells around the lumen of the capillary, and molecules will be picked up through penocytosis, right? Cellular slurping, small molecules being brought in or by endocytosis, again, a, a phagocytotic type of event. They'll be transported through vesicles across the cell's cytoplasm, and then they'll be discharged or released now by exocytosis on the other side. What sort of molecules are going to move through these cells via transcytosis? Fatty acids, relatively large. Albumin, very important protein in blood and some hormones like insulin, rather relatively large. So they, they can't move through the cell by diffusion, but they are actively moved through the cell. So in this case, the molecules are moved in and moved through the actual membrane. So they're going from one side of the cell to the other side through the cell, okay, transcytosis. Then there's filtration. Again, filtration is going to be uh, regulated by forces. So we need to talk about different forces on the flow of materials through capillaries. And for this, we're going to talk about uh, blood hydrostatic pressure. So this would be the pressure in the blood formed by hydro, by water, on the inside, and this is what's going to be driving fluid out of a capillary. 
Okay, picture's coming in a moment. And this hydrostatic pressure of the blood is always higher on the arterial end of a capillary and lower on the venous end of a capillary bed. There's also this other opposing force called the colloid osmotic pressure, the COP. And this is a pressure that's drawing fluid into the capillary, right? So the first one was doing what? Pushing fluid out of the capillary. The colloid osmotic pressure is drawing stuff into the capillary. The number one reason that things are going to be moving into a capillary has to do with the concentration of albumin. Remember albumin? It's the most abundant protein in your blood. Um, small. And remember from lab two or so in biology 105 that saw you'd suck. So the albumins, I've always told you, were the protein responsible for regulating fluid exchange into and out of your blood. If you have a lot of albumin in your blood, you have more, quote, solutes, therefore more water will be drawn into your capillaries. That is this colloid osmotic pressure. It's being pulled in, sucked in by what we talked about in the past as far as uh, a solute suck in. Then the blood hydrostatic pressure is the water-based pressure of the plasma of the blood that is pushing out. And these two, uh, these two are creating a, a balancing force uh, which is going to push fluid in or out of your blood. Um, now, there's also the, on, you'll hear it called oncotic pressure as well, and that's the net COP. So let's look at this uh, coming up in a picture in a moment. So hydrostatic pressure. Pressure caused by what? Water. Okay, I just want you to not, not don't memorize these words. Make, make them make sense to you, then it won't be hard. So this is the amount of pressure being forced by the water. And again, it's, it's basically your blood pressure. So it's basically the pressure of your blood pushing outward. Now, here's an important number. Capillaries reabsorb about 85% of the fluid that they filter. The other 15% will be reabsorbed by the lymphatic system and then later return to the blood. Let me show this to you in a picture. This is what's going on in your regular normal capillaries. Now I know this is small. This is coming from chapter 20 in your book, figure 17. On the on this image, arterial blood's coming in. So that's blood coming into an artery, okay, a small ar arterial. Blood's coming through this and is taking a little break right here. So this would be the meta-arterial as it goes into the capillary bed. This is just an extremely simplified capillary bed shown as a single vessel. But imagine this is a whole capillary bed simplified for the picture. Do you agree that the pressure on the, remember this is where the sphincters would be on this side, right? And on that side, do you agree there's going to be greater blood pressure on the arterial side than there would be over here on the venous side? Mm -hmm. Okay, we got that much figured out. Now, look at the numbers. It's telling us that at the arterial side, that there's a net filtration out. See the big arrow? It's going outward. Why? Because there is a greater blood pressure pushing fluid out at this side. Don't worry about the numbers. And there's less of that oncotic pressure. Oncotic pressure was the pulling of water in based upon the albumin concentration in the blood. As you move across the capillary bed and you get over to the venous side, the pressure has dropped, hasn't it? We know the blood pressure drops as we go through a capillary bed. On the venous side, there's actually more pull inward. There's more reabsorption inward. There's less pressure pushing out, but there's even more. That oncotic pressure is, is now overwhelming or is greater than the outward flow. So you have now a flow on the venous side coming in. So looking at the numbers on the arterial end, there's a net of 13. Don't worry about numbers. 
and on the Venus side, there's a net of seven, 13 out, and on the Venus side, seven in. So what's happening here then? In a basic way, as blood first comes in an arterial and into a capillary bed, there's a lot of molecules being pushed out. Now what's being pushed out here? Water, nutrients, anything you can mention, imagine, right, is being pushed out. And where are we out here? All this yellow stuff out here is what? What's going around the capillary bed, right? Here's capillaries, 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 capillaries. That's your tissues. All right, so when we talk about your tissues getting oxygen, getting glucose, or giving back their waste products, you have capillary beds intimately embedded into all of your tissues. And so here on the arterial side, you have more molecules being put out into your tissues. On the venous side, you have now return. Flow is increased coming back in. That flow then leaves out of the capillary bed and joins into a venule and then is returned back systemically through a series of veins. So again, don't worry about the numbers down here, but do appreciate right over here, right? 33 out is greater than 20 in. What does 33 out represent? Hydrostatic pressure, right? The blood pressure pushing out. And the 20 in represents that oncotic pressure, right? The, 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 the pull of the water in via the albumin primarily. On the other side, right, the hydrostatic pressure has decreased. The oncotic pressure really hasn't changed, has it? But it's greater than the hydrostatic pressure, so the net is inward. So a nice little video on that to review. And that's your typical capillary, right? Your continuous capillary, the capillary we think of uh, most of the time. However, there are two exceptions to this. And these are the capillaries, one found in your kidneys, and another an exception will be the capillaries found in your alveoli. What do we know about the kidneys? Again, most capillaries reabsorb most of the fluid but what were the percentages going back? Sorry, go back. What did I tell you? Most capillaries are going to reabsorb 85% of what they filter out. They're going to leave 15% floating out there in these tissues, and that 15% would normally be returned through the lymphatic system. Okay? So another way of saying that, looking at this example... 85% of what's coming into the capillary, I mean, a lot of it will be put out here in the tissues, right? But 85% of it will be returned right here on the venous side. That's going to leave 15% sitting out here in the tissues, which will be returned by the lymphatic system. Okay? The exceptions are as follows. In the kidneys and in the alveoli. What is the primary job of the Nephron. The kidney capillaries, what's their primary job? To filter the blood and allow that filtrate to leave the body. We would not want to have our glomerulus sucking back what it just let out. So the glomeruli, and here it just, it doesn't, it, the, the kidney capillaries, aka the glomeruli, do not reabsorb. Do the kidneys reabsorb? Yes, but not at the glomerulus, later on in the tubules. But at the glomerulus themselves, all that's going on is filtration out, no reabsorption. In the alveolus, the exception is there is 100% reabsorption. And why is that? Why would you not want 15% of your fluid floating around your alveoli. What would that fluid do to gas exchange in the microscopic air sacs? Decrease it, wouldn't it? So we don't want to have fluid accumulating in our lungs, right? Not a good idea to drown. So the, the capillaries in most of your body are pushing stuff out and reabsorbing 85% of it. In the kidney, the exception, it's being 100% filtered out and not being reabsorbed. In the alveoli, we have 100% reabsorption. We don't want to leave fluid 
floating around in the tissues of the lung. Okay, so that's, that's what's going on as far as filtration. Um, now, capillaries um, are in constant change from moment to moment. We talked about basal motion and those pre-capillary sphincters that can increase and decrease blood flow going into any capillary bed. And if your tissue is not very metabolically active, right, then the capillary is essentially going to be closed. Okay, blood pressure is going to be very low through that. Um, in a resting tissue, you don't need a lot of blood flow, and reabsorption will be predominant. Why would there be more reabsorption? I want you to think about that picture I showed you with the arterial in and the venule out. Why, if there's lower blood pressure, would there be greater reabsorption? Maybe more time. If there's less blood pressure going in, right? So this is the arterial going into the capillary bed and coming out the venous side, right? If there's less blood pressure going in, what's that going to do to the outward filtration? Reduce it, right? So that means that less is being put out here. Therefore, most of the fluid will be easily reabsorbed because there's less being put out into the tissues, okay? Whereas, if you have a metabolically active tissue, you're going to have even more capillary flow, and there can be an increase in accumulation, okay? An increase in muscular bulk is, is part of it is due to the accumulation of fluid. So, a, a really active, you know, muscle group, um, that, in, that constant increase in blood flow. Um, I shouldn't ask just the guys, right? But if you want to show off a little bit, what are you going to do right before you show off? Pump a little bit, right? And what's that going to do? Increase your tonality, right? Increase it. But what's it going to, it's going to give you more definition. Part of that is you've made the muscle more active. And in that, you've actually brought more fluid into that muscle group, and that's going to show off as more tone, right? More form, if you will. Okay. So that's kind of what's going on here as far as an increase in muscular bulk in that short term caused by this fluid increase because you've got that tissue more metabolically active. But what happens when this goes wrong, right? When this homeostasis, when this fluid, this capillary movement in and out goes wrong, then you're going to start having problems with accumulation of fluid, and we know that to be edema. So edema, an, an excess accumulation of this fluid. Well, why? Because more fluid is being filtered than is being reabsorbed, okay? More fluid is going to be filtered out of the capillaries than what's being reabsorbed. Again, normally we have that 85-15 split. What's going to cause edema? Number one, increased capillary filtration. Why would you have increased capillary filtration? Let's start here. Poor venous return. Put this together for me. Do we want to take a stab at that? Think about one little capillary bed, okay, and the blood leaving that capillary bed is leaving out the venules and the venous system. If there isn't good venous return, then that means that blood is not leaving out of the capillaries with this, the right pressure, right, with the right flow. What's that going to do to the capillary? Can you imagine it's going to cause, if you will, a backing up into the capillaries? Can you picture that? If venous return's not good, then fluid is going to be accumulating in the capillary area. Reabsorption will be decreased. Where is that extra fluid going to stay? In the tissues, edema. Okay, so decreased venous return leads to edema. Old age leads to some venous return issues histamine release. What's histamine release going to do? What's histamine going to do? 
histamine causes vasodilation. If there's more blood flow going to a capillary, then there would be greater what? Hydrostatic pressure pushing more fluid out. So that's also going to increase more tissue fluid, right, in the local environment. Kidney failure. You're not getting rid of fluid, right? So fluid is accumulating in your body, and so it has to go somewhere. It's going to cause some sort of edema. Okay, do all those situations, can you kind of picture them in a common sense kind of way? Second cause for edema would be reduced capillary absorption. Okay, fair enough. So what would cause this? What if you had dietary protein deficiency? We're talking eh, not like today you didn't eat enough protein, but I'm saying chronically over a long period of time you had inadequate protein in your diet. Then your body would not be able to make as much albumin. If you didn't have as much albumin, then your onchotic pressure would decrease. That is, you wouldn't have the albumin in your blood to suck water back in. So you wouldn't have the reabsorptive powers. This is why you see the kids in third world countries with the big bellies, right? They got skinny little legs, little skinny little arms. They don't have good protein in their diet, but they have the big bellies. Well, what's going on? Edema. Why? They don't have sufficient albumin in their diet, sufficient protein in their diet, and so they don't have sufficient pulling of the blood or the fluids back into their blood system. Liver disease? Well, if you have liver disease, you're not going to make as much albumin, right? So again, liver disease, low albumin, leading to protein deficiency looking things, or again, hypoproteinemia. We can break that down. Hypo, low, protein of the blood. And again, the primary, the most abundant protein in your blood is albumin. So it, some books would say hypoalbuminemia, albinemia, right? But just proteinemia is fine. But the, the bigger player here is albumin. Finally, what if you have undergone some sort of surgery or you've had something, maybe not a removal of a lymph node, but maybe you actually have a tumor that's pushing up against a lymphatic vessel, and now you don't have proper lymphatic drainage. What did I say? No, most capillaries do what? 85 goes, come back in. The other 15% that gets floating around in the tissue is going to be returned via lymphatic drainage. If your lymphatic drainage is inadequate, then that fluid is going to accumulate, right? And so people after surgery, um, if their lymphatic vessels get affected, and that's oftentimes the case, they will have a puffy area of their body. So I've had a couple ankle surgeries. My ankle's always puffy because in that surgery, they certainly interrupted some of that lymphatic drainage. And so fluid can't leave my ankle area the way that it should. And so as a result, a little puffy. Uh, people who have breast cancer surgery sometimes when they have that lumpectomy or radical mastectomy, they'll have a lot of fluid buildup in their arm because again, that fluid is not draining back through the axillary region properly or any, you name it, any kind of surgery, sometimes there can be some lymphatic issues. So those are all leading or accumulation of this tissue edema. Now what else can, what's going to happen with edema? Well, with edema, you're going to start having potentially some tissue necrosis. I mean, with edema, you're going to have some oxygen delivery issues and some waste removal, removal issues. If we're talking about in the lungs, pulmonary edema can lead to suffocation. You're going to drown to death. What else could cause pulmonary edema? I mentioned in the cardiovascular unit. What side of the heart would be weaker that would lead to some buildup of fluid in the lungs? Is it the right side or the left side that's weaker if you're leaving stuff back in the lungs? You're sucking back. So if you're not sucking back well, it's like 50-50. It's like my true-false questions. Think about it, folks. Right? The heart pushes and it sucks back. It's pushing out on the right side, going to the lungs and coming back to the left side. 
So if the left side was weaker and it wasn't sucking blood back and pumping it out adequately, then you would have accumulation in the lungs, wouldn't you? If you instead had accumulation uh, problems with the right side, you'd have accumulation where? In the body. In the body. Cerebral edema, right? If you've got issues uh, with edema in the brain, okay, it's going to be leading to headaches, nausea, not good, coma, seizures, uh, swelling in the brain is never a good thing. And what about any place else? So severe edema or circulatory shock. Now, we haven't talked about shock yet, but some, in, some individuals... Um, when they have very, very low blood volume and very low blood pressure, will start to experience what they call third spacing. And fluid starts to build up in places that normally wouldn't build up. And we're talking like the entire body starts to sort of, all that fluid comes out of the blood and is now in the interstitial spaces and the individual starts to, again, like I said, third space. There's fluid accumulating all over the place. And um, this is usually a very, very significant problem. Is that when um, fluid starts to leak out the skin? It can, yeah. It can really cause so much pressure that it can start to actually, yeah, be, be released. Okay, so questions so far. How are we doing? Making sense so far? You know this. You know this. We, so we were talking about exchange in the capillaries. You know this story. You know what pulls the blood back to the heart. You know about venous return. We've talked about this before. So in your vessels, there is very, very little blood pressure in your veins. You know that. 7 to 13, some very, very low number, less than 20. And by the time we get up to the vena cava and come back to the heart, we're talking about five millimeters of mercury. So very, very low pressure coming back into the heart. Gravity's working against you. The skeletal muscle pump, well, actually, gravity's working for you when it comes to bringing blood back, right, from the head and from the neck, right? Gravity's actually working to your benefit. But for the rest of your body, it's working against you as the blood is being brought back up to your heart. And we've already talked about the skeletal muscle pump. That is, every time you walk, you're squeezing your muscles. Many of your larger blood-returning veins are quite deep and are being compressed by that. You have the thoracic pump, right? We talk about skeletal muscle pump the most. There's also the thoracic or the respiratory pump. And that is, every time you inhale, your thoracic cavity is expanding and that's actually helping to drive blood back up, okay? So blood is flowing faster with inhalation. So as you inhale, it's actually causing blood to return back faster. When you're exhaling, it slows down. But again, this is helping to bring the blood back. We'll talk about the lungs and all that in the next chapter. And then, of course, the heart is a pump. It is not only pushing but also sucking back. Yeah, thoracic and pulmonary pump all would be the same thing, all dealing with respiration. So the skeletal muscle pump, think your leg muscles for the most part. Think, uh, for example, you could imagine your gastrocnemius, right? Two heads of your gastrocnemius, lateral and medial, and as you contract, it's pushing that blood. The valves that are present in those veins are keeping the blood from going back down. The blood is being pushed up through those veins, sorry, through those valves, and again, once it gets up to a certain place, it can't go back down. So that's certainly helping you. Again, the pressure changes also of the thoracic cavity, the sucking of the blood and gravity to some extent, helping you from the top and hurting you with the return back from the legs. What happens when you're exercises? When you're exercising, sorry. When you're exercising, clearly your heart's beating faster. Remember, not only is it beating faster, it's also beating harder. That's going to increase your cardiac output. It's going to increase your blood pressure. We know this. Your skeletal muscles, your lungs, your heart are going to dilate and get more blood flow. You're going to have an increased respiratory rate that's going to increase your thoracic pump. 
and you're increasing your skeletal muscle pump, so all of those things are contributing to the blood moving faster and increasing your cardiac output. What happens if you're not active, however? If you're not active, then we can have venous pooling. Okay, so not enough blood is returning. That's going to, um, and, and it often happens with prolonged standing. Anybody been in a marching band or a choir, right, and you're at attention for a long period of time, and especially on a hot day and they're dehydrated, you'll see people kind of falling out off the back of the end of the risers or in a competition, they'll, they'll kind of buckle and go down. Um, you know, military does the same thing when they're at attention for a long time. Anything like that where you're standing there and uh, the blood, you know, and you're already kind of stressed out for whatever the reason is, and that can lower your cardiac output low enough to cause dizziness. And um, what can you do for that? Well, just start squeezing those leg muscles a little bit. So just kind of pump, even if you're standing still, right? If you can, just pump those leg muscles a little bit, and that should restore that skeletal muscle pump, get that blood going back, increase your uh, cardiac output. And this is why pilots wear pressure suits when they're in a high altitude place, because what's happening? With lower atmospheric pressure, and they're sitting there, right? They're not moving. And so they have lower atmospheric pressure, and they're not moving their legs much, and so we wear, they wear these pressure suits. It's the same reason that individuals wear pressure stockings, right? We'll put on a pair of pressure stockings um, to help with venous return. Um, and, and you'll see people with any kind of circulation issues oftentimes wearing them. The nice thing is, is that these, so these socks now come in colors. You wouldn't even know it. In the old days, they were the white ones, right? The white stockings. And you go to the beach in Florida and all the people, right, they're wearing shorts and they have the white stockings up to their knee and they have the little hat and the little, um, you know, metal detector on the beach. You picturing it, right? So now those stockings are much more colorful, much more stylish. So they can be wearing uh, these pressure stockings without really letting it be known that they're pressure stockings. So they come in all kinds of pretty colors now. Okay. Um, if someone says that you are in shock, what are they usually suggesting to you? Something rather traumatic has happened, right? And we say, oh, you're in shock. Mm -hmm. That's one way of using the word. But in, the, in a physiological way of using the word, shock is any way in which there isn't enough cardiac output to maintain the body's needs. Okay, and there's a couple of different types of shock that we're going to look at. So in all kinds of shock, the blood pressure drops. Foof. And with that blood pressure dropping, there's no longer sufficient cardiac output. And therefore, the needs of the body are not being met. So cardiogenic shock. Okay, we know what genic means, right? Caused by, formed by, starting with the heart. So a cardiogenic shock would be an inadequate pumping of the heart. Why? The patient may be having an MI. So the heart's not pumping, and therefore, right, we're not getting adequate perfusion to meet the body's metabolic needs. There can also be low venous return. Now, cardiac output is so low because very little blood is returning to the heart. Well, why, why would there be less blood returning to the heart? Give me one reason. You're hemorrhaging, right? You're bleeding out. So if you're bleeding out, then you would have less blood coming back to the heart. So let's talk about, that'd be a circulatory shock, okay? So let's think about this. The most common type of circulatory shock would be a hypovolemic shock. Let's break it down. Don't memorize it. Just think about what it means. Less or low what? Low volume. volume. Most common. Again, you're bleeding out. Uh, you're losing blood volume. Uh, maybe through some sort of trauma. Maybe a burn. A burn, you may not be bleeding out, but what are you losing? Fluid, right? And that fluid is going to contribute to your blood pressure as well. Or you are tremendously dehydrated. Again, fluid issues, not enough blood, fluid, not enough pressure, not enough plasma, hypovolemic. There's also an obstructed venous return. Okay, so it could be one of two things. One, you've got a tumor. That tumor is pushing up against a vein. Uh, you may not even be aware of it if it's not hitting a nerve, but you're blocking venous return. So insufficient blood coming back or by an aneurysm, right? So again, a bulging out, a problem with a vein. 
compressing on a vein. So an aneurysm happens where? Aneurysms happen on arteries. And arteries always travel right next to veins. So if there's an aneurysm and the wall of the artery is bulging out, it might be pushing out against the vein. You know that the vein is rather wimpy and it would be compressed by that aneurysm. Again, you know, there may not be any pain issues, but that blood is not returning back to the heart adequately. Again, referring to a obstructed venous return situation. And then finally, there could be, uh, again, when you're standing there for a long period of time, or you're sitting, blood's not flowing, and you just have a venous pooling, right? Widespread vasodilation. Uh, this is people with maybe some varicose veins. Blood is pooling in their lower extremities. They're just not getting adequate perfusion, adequate supply back. There are other types of shock, however, <coughs> besides just cardiogenic. There is neurogenic shock. Hmm. It could be caused from emotional shock to brain stem injury. If you have a brain stem injury, brain stem injury, it could be affecting what? It could be affecting the medulla oblongata. And the medulla oblongata is where you have your cardiac center. So if you have damage to your medulla, you would no longer be able to maintain your sympathetic parasympathetic control. Remember, the heart is still initiating its heart rate by the pacemaker, but it's being controlled by the sympathetic parasympathetic signals coming from the medulla oblongata. So if you had damage to your brainstem, maybe you had a brainstem stroke, right, damage to that part of the brainstem, then you may have issues regulating your blood pressure and would have neurogenic shock. Septic shock. You'll learn about this one more in microbiology. Bacteria, some of them, uh, when they enter into your bloodstream, uh, release a toxin. That toxin can be a very, very, very uh, potent vasodilator. So what's going to happen? All of your vessels are going to, with when you have septic shock, all of your blood vessels, in response to the toxin made by the bacteria, are going to vasodilate. Not only do these toxins cause all the vessels to open up, but they cause the capillaries to become more leaky. They increase the capillary permeability. So what's going to happen to your overall blood pressure? Remember, at one point, at one moment in your body, three-fourths of your capillaries are shut down, only one-fourth are open, and that's that vasal motion, that taking turns with the precapillary sphincters. But if the bacterial toxin causes all of your vessels to essentially open up, Boyle tells us, right, with increased volume, pressure goes down. So the overall blood pressure drops very, very dangerously low. So that's one of the issues with a, with a person who has a... Um, bacterial infection, some bacteria are known to cause septic shock, and it can be devastating. Right? When people die of sepsis, it's usually from shock. Number four, whatever it is, anaphylactic shock. Again, this would be um, bee sting, peanut allergy, the kind of situation where uh, the body goes into a severe immune reaction to an antigen. One of the body's tricks to that is that it's going to release histamines. So you get a bee sting, histamines are released, histamines are themselves a vasodilator, same story, right? So you can have this dramatic drop in blood pressure from anaphylactic shock. So anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, cardiogenic shock, um, septic shock, you name it, all of them are connected by the what? Drop in blood pressure by different means, but all connected by a drop in blood pressure. So what can your body do? In the moment, it really has a choice. It has a choice of responding to the shock, that is to compensate for it, or not, <laughs> okay? If it compensates, you'll survive, <laughs> right? Now, how might it compensate? You, you might faint. Is that a compensation? What did your body do? It, it said, hey, dummy, lay down, right? Voluntarily or involuntarily, you faint. You lay down. Now your 
laying down, your blood pressure is restored, at least the blood pressure to your brain will be better than it was when you were standing up. So your body might respond by causing you to go into syncope or into a fainting situation. If the body is not able to compensate for this, then it can be very, very life-threatening. Okay? And what happens is that as blood pressure drops, it's one of those positive feedback mechanisms. What's a positive feedback mechanism? When things get out of whack, they go further and further out of whack, right? They don't get returned back to normal. Positive feedback, not a positive outcome, but positive feedback is when things start to move away from normal and they accelerate away from normal. And so if your blood pressure is dropping and you have no way of stopping the bleed or stopping that massive dilation, the heart has no choice but to slow down and slow down as pressure is dropping and it gets worse and worse until you no longer have adequate cardiac output to support the brain okay, or the heart. Remember, I also told you that when uh, there's low blood pressure, the kidneys get really, really mad at you. So the kidneys shut down too when there isn't adequate blood pressure. We'll talk about that when we get to the urinary system. Okay, how are we doing? Let me finish up this chapter. I want to get to about slide 115. Uh, which is about nine more slides, and then I'm going to skip over a bunch of slides which are basically name that vessel. Um, on the exam, I would ask you to know some vessels, but they're going to be the exact same vessels that you had to know on this week's lab exam. Okay? So I'm not going to increase your list incredibly, but I'll just have you review those. And then I have about five slides at the very big end of this presentation to also go over with you, and then that'll finish up this chapter. So let me get there before we get to take, take a break. Now, we talked about different types of circulation patterns. In fact, let's review that right now. Describe for me the normal circulation pattern. When you think about circulation, right, arteries down to little arterioles, into capillaries, out the little venules, back the veins, right? That's the normal complete cycle. Uh, what was a portal system? When instead of one capillary bed, there were two. Right, where do we have some portal systems in our body? I heard liver? Kidneys. Kidney, right? The glomerulus followed by the precap by the tubule capillaries or the vasa recta. And what was the third? There were a couple other uh, examples in that there was the shunt and there were anastomoses. Right? So go back to those different pathways. Um, now I just want to talk about a couple of organs that must have good blood flow. So brain. As we saw in that one pie diagram, the blood flow to the brain really can't and does not change much. Um, it, it really can fluctuate very, very little. You need to have about 700 mils per minute of blood going to the brain at all times. You don't want more, right? More would cause the blood pressure to increase too much and could cause one to stroke out. So you want to have enough, but not too much, highly regulated. Just a few seconds of uh, blood deprivation to the brain can cause one to lose consciousness. Four to five minutes leads to irreversible brain damage. So this is not something you want to mess with, right? Um, blood flow within the brain is moved around. If you recall seeing any kind of PET scans that I've shown you, you know that certain parts of the brain light up, are more active at different times based upon what's going on in the environment, but still about 700 mils per minute of blood going to the brain. <coughs> We've already mentioned this. How is the brain so carefully monitoring its blood pressure and its perfusion? Well, number one, as systemic, this is different, as systemic blood pressure drops. So your overall blood pressure is dropping. Just imagine that for a moment. The brain could be in trouble, couldn't it? When the overall systemic blood pressure begins to drop, the cerebral arteries going up to the brain actually will dilate. Okay? So the cerebral arteries dilate as the overall blood pressure drops. And what's that doing? Again, it's protecting the blood flow up to the brain. And what's going to cause this are the situations we've already described. Hypercapnia, which is an increase in 
CO2 levels going to the brain. If you have increased CO2 levels to the brain, then the pH is going to decrease, and that's going to trigger some vasodilation, some opening up of the vessels. You could, what if you had hypocapnia? What is that? Hypocapnia would be a decrease in CO2, a.k.a. an increase in oxygen, typically. Well, what's going to happen to the blood pH when you are hypocapnic? pH is going to go up, more basic. That stimulates vasoconstriction. Now, hypocapnia happens when? Low CO2. Well, and we'll talk more about this next unit, but what goes on with hyperventilation? When a person is hyperventilating, what are they doing? <laughs> right, they're so out of it that they're breathing excessively. And that actually causes them not to be able to get rid of, or, or the, the, the CO2, um, as they're hyperventilating, can cause them to get dizzy, right? They get dizzy. So what do you tell someone who's hyperventilating? Put your head down, try to slow down your breathing, maybe even paper bag, right? And what's the paper bag doing? It's making you're blowing out CO2 too fast. So when you're hyperventilating, you're getting rid of CO2 faster than your body really should. So your CO2 is going down, so your blood pH is going up. And that can cause vasoconstriction to the brain. If you're not getting a blood to the brain, what are you going to do? Faint. Okay. So what do we do to fix the problem? Paper bag. What's that? What are we doing now? The CO2 that we're blowing out too quickly is now being brought back into the body. The CO2 levels are now being corrected. They're no longer going to be hypocapnic. They're no longer going to constrict the blood flow to the brain and hopefully they won't faint. Okay, so syncope is fainting. Okay. Does that story make sense? Yeah. Okay, make sense of it if it's not, because we've all heard about someone becoming hyperventilating, and we know we might can them a paper bag, and we know that they might faint, but does it all make sense in regards to CO2 and pH levels and the vasoconstriction going to the brain? Okay. And then also, turn it around, when you have too much CO2, you're going to increase the blood flow to the brain. Now, people have TIAs, right? TIAs are like, quote, mini strokes. They're called the transient ischemic attacks. Uh, it's not a blown out, it's not a big blowout stroke, but little, again, you'll hear them called mini strokes. So little brief episodes of cerebral ischemia. If we're talking about the heart, this would be similar to what condition? When does a person with heart disease have sort of a decrease in blood flow, a temporary ischemia? Angina. Angina. Right, angina, that temporary ischemia, not a complete blockage, not an MI, but a little bit of a temporary blockage, a little bit of discomfort, a little lactic acid buildup of the heart. Similar, similar, similar. A TIA, then, is a, is a temporary uh, cerebral ischemia, a little spazzing, if you will, of some diseased cerebral artery. The person may experience a little bit of dizziness. They may have a little loss of vision for a moment, a little paralysis, a little aphasia, which is a, a, a problem speaking, but it recovers because they didn't sustain any long-lasting, significant brain damage. Maybe a little bit, and if a person has multiple TIAs over time, it can begin to look like a more significant problem, okay? So somebody, you know, they say they kind of zone out for a moment. They have a little lack of consciousness or they, they, they see things. They have little vision issues. Um, and and uh, it can be definitely a sign of some more significant problems coming down the road, just like angina could be a significant sign that there's a heart attack in the horizon. So same idea. Now, if we have a complete block of oxygen going up to the brain, that's a stroke or what's called a CVA. I love the word accident, right? Cerebral vascular accident. 
um, sudden loss of brain damage or brain tissue due to any of the following things. Atherosclerosis, right, a, a building up of plaque going to an important part of the brain. Any part's important. A thrombosis, a what? A clot of sorts. And a ruptured aneurysm. You blew out a vessel. Blood flow's not normal, and so that part of the brain dies off. So again, any of those could cause a CVA. The effects have a lot to do with where and the extent, just like in a heart attack. How, what's the outcome of a heart attack? Depends upon which vessel <laughs> and how much of the heart was damaged. Same too with the brain, particularly what lobe was damaged, how much of the lobe, was it a critical area for a particular function? Um, and again, blindness if it's in the occipital lobe, right? Um, paralysis if it's in the motor strip area, motor lobe, uh, the frontal lobe. It could be a loss of sensation if it's over in the parietal lobe. It could be a problem with speech if it's on the left hemisphere in the Wernicke's or in the Broca's areas, depending upon which area. Recovery just depends upon the neighboring neurons and the extent of damage and collateral circulation. In other words, that's the idea of anastomosis. Um, if, a, if there is a lack of oxygen to a part of the brain, is there another route for oxygen to come in to minimize that long-term deprivation and increase circulation and help for, hope for some recovery? Remember, the, the neurons aren't going to be they're not going to be regenerated. That part of the brain is gone. But are there other parts of the brain that can come in and assist? And can there be um, cooperation, if you will, with the other side of the brain? So that's a special situation for brain. Not much variation there. Can't do without oxygen. Skeletal muscles are exactly the opposite. They have an extremely highly variable flow of blood. We know this. A muscle can be at rest or it can be in movement. And at rest, the arterioles are going to constrict. The blood flow will be reduced almost down to nothing. I mean, about one liter per minute. During exercise, of course, those arterioles dilate. Uh, that could be in response to a sympathetic surge or some epinephrine, norepinephrine. Those capillary sphincters are going to dilate. More, more uh, muscle metabolites are going to be formed, like lactic acid and CO2. So what's going to happen? Not only are you increasing the activity, and creating acid-like waste products, that's going to do what? Drop the pH. And we know that with lower pH, vessels dilate even more, bringing even more blood flow to the organ. And blood flow can be increased rather significantly. But every time you contract a muscle, you're also impeding flow to that muscle. Sounds a lot like the heart, doesn't it? Every time the heart contracts, what is getting blocked a little bit? Remember this, every time the heart contracts, the coronary arteries are being blocked off as the aortic semilunar valve opens up, and so there's a little bit of a, of a less blood flow at that moment. Same idea as you're contracting your skeletal muscles, that squeezing is actually uh, decreasing flow, which is why isometric contraction is so tiring. So everyone, I want somebody show me isometric contraction. Demonstrate it for me. Yeah, pushing against your own arms, right? Just push, right? Isometric, your muscles aren't changing their length. You're pushing. You're going to tire rather quickly. And part of it is you're actually cutting off blood flow to your muscles in part because you're not allowing any kind of flow. So whatever was cut off is cut off, and it's going to lead to fatigue more quickly. From postural stability now, remember we've got... Um, that your postural muscles are more the slow oxidative versus the fast, fast glycolytic. So your, your erector spinae muscles, a lot of your core muscles uh, have a little bit more of that slow, glyc a slow oxidative characteristic, so they're less likely to fatigue, okay? And um, you don't sit here and contract your, your core muscles. Right? You have muscles that are working against each other, and they're kind of working together, but you don't sit there and squeeze your core muscles for very long. Okay. If you did, you'd, you'd fatigue. Lungs, another special place, um, have a relatively low blood pressure. 
makes sense, right? There's, there's not as much blood pressure going to the lungs because it's being pushed out by the right ventricle. The right ventricle is not pushing with anywhere near as much pressure as the left ventricle. So blood is going into the, in, into the lungs at about 25 over 10. Hmm. Right? Systolic, diastolic. That's not a lot of pressure. But it didn't have to go very far. And we wouldn't want to be blowing too much pressure over to the heart because you get all those capillaries, or sorry, over to the lungs, you get all those capillaries. And if you had too much blood pressure going into the lungs and the capillaries, you'd be blowing out those capillaries. So we want to regulate that pressure. And we want it to be rather slow. We want that blood moving over into the lungs slowly so there is adequate time for gas exchange. Because the primary job of the lungs is for gas exchange. If you've got blood, we didn't talk about this a moment ago, we talked about filtration and reabsorption. But if your blood is going through your capillaries too quickly, then there wouldn't be adequate time for the exchange of gases. Remember, gas exchange is via diffusion, and it requir requires um, uh, concentration gradients. Again, also in the lungs, what did I say already? That in the lungs, there is no fluid accumulation because here the capillaries are unique in that they absorb all of it. They don't leave anything behind in the interstitial fluid. There's a special situation here, though. What do lungs do in response to hypoxia? Normally, what would your vessels do in response to hypoxia? Shay, what would they do? The vessel's not getting enough oxygen. We local environment. Normally, we would expect a vessel to open up, right? I'm not getting enough oxygen right now. Open up. The lungs are different. When the lungs become hypoxic, they constrict. This is why a person can have a part of their lung be diseased, and the lung, I'm, I'm going to speak kind of sort of teleologically here, but the lung is, the, the lung tissue that is diseased says, you know what, I'm no good to the body. I'm no longer exchanging gas as well. So rather than trying to increase the blood flow to the troubled area, the lung closes down those areas. Now blood is being shunted only to the healthy areas of the lung. Okay, that's backwards, isn't it, from what we talked about. Hypoxemia normally would cause a vessel to open up, and the lung hypoxemia causes the vessels to close down, move away from the diseased area. And this is why a person can have a lobectomy, right? They can have a part of the lung that's diseased removed and it's okay. I mean, they can, they can survive because the lung will already bring oxygen to the healthy part. Okay, so that brings us through those special circumstances. And then I don't want you to forget, and I know you already know this, and we're going into the respiratory system this week and next, uh, don't forget about the pulmonary circuit being all backwards. When we're talking about blue and red and arteries and veins, don't forget that the pulmonary circuit is, is backwards in that uh, blood is coming into the lungs in venous blood, and the capillaries now regenerate those oxygen levels. So normally we think about a capillary going from red to blue. In the capillaries, everything would be backwards. The capillaries would honestly be going from blue to red. Blue blood coming in, red blood leaving. So everything's, kind of, everything's absolutely reversed when you're thinking about the pulmonary circuit. Again, all these little alveoli here, the blood, don't forget, is coming in, blue blood, the pulmonary arteries and the arterioles coming into capillaries, dropping off, not really dropping off blue and picking up red, right, but picking up oxygen and then leaving out smaller venules which in this case are red, right? So the arterioles are blue coming in, the venules are red leaving, draining back eventually to the larger pulmonary uh, veins and then back to the left atrium. So that's what I want to discuss there. Now the rest of this is just a quick review about arteries and veins, arteries and veins, things you already know. Okay, so you're just going to flip through these images. Okay, and at the very end of this,
Aren't those beautiful images? They're just gorgeous, yeah. right? So, I mean, just really, it's worthwhile looking at this. And I think I said it last week, I hope I did, that I think it's worthwhile for those going into the lab exam this week, which is all of you, that you at least fly through these. Uh, because on the lab exam, I am using APR images and Flat Stanley images, and those are mostly APR images there. Uh, you've also had inter practice with those as you did your quiz going into the lab exam this week, uh, both um, APR quiz uh, and reviewing Flat Stanley. The last thing are just the three or four slides at the very, very end of this, skipping over to slide 165. That's on what page? 289. 289, thank you. So we, we also discussed in lab last week that one can take pressure, uh, or sorry, take a, a pulse. And by taking one pulse, what are we feeling for? We're feeling that stretch and recoiling of the artery because arteries are so elastic. And we're sensing the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure. And what's the name for that? The difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure we know is called the Difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure? Pulse pressure. Did I hear it, Vince? All right, the pulse pressure. Okay. So if is the pulse pressure greater at the aorta or greater at the femoral artery? It's greater at the aorta, right? So your pulse is easier to detect, right, in your carotid arteries, easier to detect in your brachial arteries, and becomes not, not more difficult, but the, the pulse would be more difficult or less obvious in your extremities. Hypertension, the silent killer, because there are really no <coughs> symptoms, if you will, if someone is hypertensive. Um, large percentage of Americans are hypertensive. A larger percentage of African Americans are hypertensive than the general population. And um, it's considered the silent killer, because what's it doing? What is hypertension doing to your overall cardiovascular system? Wearing it down. Let's use terms that we learned in the last unit, right? What are you doing? You're increasing, the big word is here, you're increasing the afterload. afterload. Remember the afterload is essentially the resistance that the heart is experiencing as it's trying to push blood out. And what's causing that increase in afterload? Things like atherosclerosis, right, and, and, and closing of the arteries. Over time, what does that do? Causes the myocardium to enlarge, become overstretched, and less efficient. With less efficiency, stroke volume goes down. Heart rate has to increase to compensate to a point, and that was really the whole take-home lesson of last week's lab in that heart is a pump idea, that at some point, the body cannot simply increase heart rate to make up for this decreased stroke volume. Another part of hypertension is that people with high blood pressure uh, are prone to significant kidney disease. And here's why. Uh, the renal arterioles right, going into the, into the kidneys, really tend to get hit hard by this, and they thicken in response to this high blood pressure. So what's happened to your kidneys? If they're thickening, then they're not getting sufficient flow. You're not getting sufficient blood pressure to the kidneys. If you're not getting sufficient blood pressure to the kidneys, then you're not filtering. And you're not, therefore, also getting rid of fluid and this can lead to salt retention. Salt retention is going to lead to edema. Okay. And uh, overall, what does that edema do? A person with hypertension, the last thing they want is more fluid on their body. Because more fluid on the body increases the hypertension even more. So a person with hypertension would take perhaps one line of medical help is to take diuretics, right, which is going to keep that fluid off the body, but the kidneys, right, are, are continuing through this hypertension. So, so the number one thing is keep the blood pressure down, and that's why so many Americans are on some sort of blood pressure med. Uh, I mean, half the country is on a blood pressure med by age 40 because their blood pressure creeps up a little bit, and they're put on a med. Well, we know that in the long term, that's a good thing. 
If we can keep blood pressure down, we can keep kidney damage down, we can keep cardiovascular disease down, that's all good in the overall population. So in the long term, we want to keep hypertension down and minimize the long-term effects of that with the heart, the brain. Because again, hypertension is what? Blows out aneurysms, right? Aneurysms caused by high blood pressure, aneurysms, stroke, aortic aneurysms, all those nasty things we've been talking about are the direct result of hypertension. What's going to cause hypertension? Some things that we can control, some things we can't. So primary hypertension would be things that are the direct result, if you will. So uh, nicotine, diet, uh, not enough exercise, obesity can be primary causes of hypertension. Then there are also secondary hypertensive issues, and that is if you have kidney disease, right? You have kidney disease, and as a result of that kidney disease, you also get high blood pressure. So that's a secondary form. Or if you have hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroidism can lead also to hypertension. So that brings us to the end of that chapter. Let's take a break. If there are any questions, I'll entertain them now. Take about a five-minute break or so. We'll come back and we'll continue and uh, come back with any questions you have as well.